It was sort of fortuitous that we ran into each other, um, but found out that we're fellow jerks. Uh, and, and it really goes back to my writing of Jerk and releasing that. Can you kind of share the story of, of, I guess, how we ran into each other? Well, yes, I was in a conference uh, in a meeting room that was empty and Kirk Bourne was there. And he said, are you a fellow speaker? I said, no, I came to watch you because you put the, tele- the Hubble telescope in space and you seem an interesting person to talk to. So we had time to burn before everybody else arrived in the room. And he said, what do you want to talk about? And so, well, derivatives. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in, you know, derivatives beyond acceleration because everybody in the industry and in finance and in everything talk about speed and acceleration and I'm more interested in finding trends and see what's trending and see and see how you control acceleration and he say oh you're interested in jerks <laughs> and my face was completely blank he said what the first question is did I hear you correctly the second question is what the hell are you talking about and the third question is tell me more and he said, well, I'm going to tell you, but the first thing I'm going to tell you is I'm going to introduce to my friend Chris, who wrote a book called The Jerk. And he's like, yes, you got my attention. <laughs> got, got my Kindle, got my, got my phone. And as we were talking, I'm ordering your book. I said, okay, this is what I'm reading tonight. Okay. And we started talking about why jerks are important, not just, outside, not just in math and physics, but outside of the concept of math and physics. And he pointed me to your book. We had an interesting conversation. Then we connected through LinkedIn, and I read your other books. And uh, it was, I, I hope, the beginning of a good friendship because we have a lot of things in common in the way that we think. You, you well, try to... Yeah, we, we jerks have to band together, right? Because, you know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then I think many of the people that watch will probably know Kirk, but I mean, Kirk is just, I mean, he's literally, I think, isn't he like considered the most famous uh, influencer in social media around anything to do with transformation and digital and analytics? He's a you know, brilliant guy. Um, yeah. And it's funny, you got, you know, people would probably pay a hundred bucks uh, a minute for the time that you got with them there. So you got lucky. <laughs> well, I was very early in the room and, uh, you know, it's the big expo, big data in Excel in London. And people go to the booths and talk to people. And I went directly to the conference room because I wanted to have a seat in first row. And in fact, I arrived before him. So he arrives and he says, are you another <clears throat> fellow speaker? No. So the, the whole thing is I studied big data and social analytics in, in one of the MOOC in, in MIT, in Media Lab. And I had a lot to learn talking about big data and analytics. And Kirk is the number one listed for AI, big data, analytics, and all that stuff. And he was doing one of his master classes, opening the whole session, the whole, the whole Congress at the Excel in London, which is the event for artificial intelligence and big data. So it was the person to be talking to. And when we switched to this subject, I found it even more fascinating. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and so you mentioned you went to see him because of his background in, in space telescopes and so forth. That's how I was exposed to Jerk. When, when I graduated uh, college and I went to work for Lockheed Martin building spacecraft, it was among the things that we had to calculate when we were designing spacecraft. It's interesting, the, the, the worst environment that a spacecraft goes through, except for potentially being in space with radiation and so forth, but it's, it's inside the nose cone of the rocket as it's going up. And, and the biggest load is actually the acoustics. It's the noise that's resonating inside of the nose cone. It's not necessarily the vibration from the rocket itself. And so jerk was one of the things you had to calculate. Yeah. And, and you've, you've read the book Jerk. So I love the yeah. story about my one colleague where we're working on, it, it's Terra. It was the spacecraft that eventually kind of proved global warming or, or measured global warming. Yeah. And my colleague, we had this colleague, uh, um, oriental guy, PhD, hardcore mathematician, um, absolutely no personal hygiene skills whatsoever, which is kind of what you expect from that. All right, rock, typical rocket scientist. And and he comes up to us one day and he's like, "Okay, the design's going to fail in the ninth ninth dimension, in the ninth derivative." And we're like, "What are you nuts? Who calculates the ninth dimension or the ninth derivative?" To your point, you were interested in derivatives, and nobody really believed him. But we're like, "Well, you know, we don't want to make a two or three billion dollar mistake, so let's make a model and we'll test it out." And lo and behold, if he wasn't right, we built a model of the structure, we threw it on a, a vibration table, and the thing blew up like twenty seconds later. So yeah, jerk is a real thing. And, and so when I came up with my second book, I wanted to use the title jerk, A, because it would piss off, a, because it would piss off my editor and my publisher, right, which it did. 
Um, B because it's <laughs> it, it's a such a multi-purpose word, right? You can use it. It's it's not the double entendre. It's like the quadruple entendre. Um, mm-hmm. And and it also as the whole point of the book was looking at how, how in 2014 how could an Uber how could an Airbnb be so disruptive just by having an app. And and so those people that build those apps would self-proclaim, yeah, I'm a jerk. I'm being a jerk. I'm doing jerky kind of things. And their competition would be like, what a bunch of jerks. They're doing stuff they're not supposed to do. So, so I mean, it kind of all held together. And I, and I think that, too, is the kind of work that uh, you've been interested in as well. Yeah, and, and I'm particularly interested in reclaiming terms. So the, the term hacker, the term nerd. Mm. are terms that are reclaimed by the community as terms of pride, okay? There's a famous song by Tim Minchin on Prejudice when he reclaims the, name, the term ginger, and he makes a lot of other jokes about what other works you can write with the same letters. And it's about the fact that a particular community owns a term. And I think that nerds own the term nerd in the way as hacker used to be the good guy, the tinker that gets things together, in the same way the jerks thinks, how can I disrupt this system in a way that I do re-engineering, not of this particular piece, but of the whole ecosystem. Yeah. And in, in some way, the, the person that you describe as jerks in your book are the people who don't think in terms of their own company, that, but they think in terms of the ecosystem, the, the ecosystem economics. And the advantage that they do is that they control the management of the ecosystem. Effectively, the Amazon, the Ubers, the Airbnbs, all those people are the people who manage, men, they, they manage the ecosystem, control the information, not just within their company, but control the whole ecosystem. Well, and the parallel that's, I like to make... That's an interesting point. Yeah, the parallel I like to make is the movie The Matrix. There is no spoon, right? Yeah. You're sitting there trying to say, well, you can't <laughs> bend the spoon with your mind, and the jerk's just saying there is no spoon, so I can do whatever I want. Mm-hmm. And, and, and you know, one of the reasons you know, I went to law school later in my career, and part of that was because I saw the disruptive nature of a lot of data and analytics and, mm-hmm. and personalization engines and everything. And um, and it's funny, you know, I'll, I'll joke with all these executives I meet with at traditional companies, and I'm like, you have a compliance department, and their job is to say no. <laughs> you know, if I go to a jerk company like an Uber, they have a non-compliance department, and their job is to say yes, and here's what it's going to cost us in regulatory fines. Right. Yep. And as long as that's a positive number, it's worth doing. But but they recognize that their opportunity actually lies in doing the things that their competitors don't believe are doable or they're mm-hmm. being regulated and prevented from doing it, et cetera, et cetera. You know, Uber's illegal in like half the places they operate and they don't care. And that's part of what makes them so effective. Yeah, you, you could argue that in terms of ecosystem, they have to provide a value to the community that is greater than the inconvenience to the community for not complying with the current regulation to the point of the community demanding that the current regulation be abolished or not used or not enforced as much. There are some ethical constraints on what you can do as a disruptor in an ecosystem. There are those that care a lot and there are those that care a bit less. And the sustainability long term, Apple is a good case of being a disruptor but caring about what the community thinks. And yes, they disrupted a whole bunch of other people, starting from IBM and company, but they have a loyal community that supports the change that they're doing, that supports the disruption that they are providing to the ecosystem. And, and, and so when I came up with the, the idea of the trinities, you know, the analog yep. trinity, bureaucracy process rules, digital trinity, um, uh, mo- mobility, social media analytics, that was the key piece. Rather mm-hmm. than saying, I'm going to follow some arbitrary rule, which gives us the best average results on average, which is kind of what rules do. Um, instead, we use yeah. analytics, just like you do, and we say, in this moment in time, here's the right thing to do. To your point about the community saying the the risk reward equation um, it tips towards reward, so we're going to do it. But that, but but not on average. We're doing it for every single instance of of a possibility of engagement, right? That's, yeah. the, that's, what I, that's what I call the context economy. In this moment, I need an Uber to pick up this person right here, right now. And then if, if an Uber driver shows up five minutes later, they get nothing. Well, the, this, this, there's a value in the treatment of ephemeral conditions. You know, the ephemeral conditions is what allows you to do yield management. 
Yes. You'll manage with this what airlines use to sell a seat and you want to go tomorrow in this particular flight and you pay a thousand dollars and the person next to you paid five dollars for the same seat in the same flight in the same everything because of uh, yield management techniques that allow you to find what is the marginal cost for all of these people. I remember in, in 1980s uh, studying in the operational research society and you say well this is simplex method and these are the shadow prices and the shadow prices are derivatives are partial derivatives of one thing and the other one and you go and say okay I want to optimize a big model on Google Cloud and TensorFlow and everything else and you're still finding you know what is the best way to navigate and you're working through derivatives so it is important to think in differential terms I had one stage in my career where I was doing project evaluation. Just before going to work for IBM as product manager for spreadsheets. So that gives an idea. I used to do very serious project evaluations. Hey, hey, by, the way, by the way, thanks. I wanted you to do a segue into your career because it's fascinating, you know, media labs, et cetera, et cetera. So, so please de delve deeply well, into the discussion. <laughs> well, the, the point is that when Situation, people think that you need to know the math and the thing that you need to know is to think differentially. So you have to say this is option A and this is the alternative option B and you need to do the balance of what is the delta between one and the other one. So before you build a spreadsheet you're thinking in your mind what are the different scenarios of all the intersections of all the boolean elements and you're calculating the derivatives. And then you build the spreadsheet okay and if it's one two three or excel or whatever the hell it doesn't matter okay. Most people know the math and don't know the basics. So once you're trained to think in differential terms outside of the computer, when you begin to think how to optimize with the computer, uh, the thinking, the way of thinking allows you to do things that otherwise you would not be able to do. Okay, so if you compare uh, what am I doing in gradient descent in, in, to optimize the model, what I was doing when I was using simplex is the same method of navigating one dimension at a time and going one step at a time. And if you think of TensorFlow or the dedicated chief for ML and whatever, they are doing the same thing. They are doing transmogrification of huge tables that have a meaning only if you think differentially. So there's a, there's a, there's a whole branch of consulting that you can do, which is what I'm trying to do in my private life now with a couple of other scientists and friends and associates, uh, we set up a small company. We're still in stealth mode, so we haven't launched yet. So this is a bit of a preview of what we're trying to do. But we try to go to a company and say, okay, what are your KPIs? And what are your KPIs? And what's the KPI at a particular point? What is the growth of that KPI? What is the acceleration of that KPI? And what are you going to go to change that acceleration? And the next question is, why are you not doing that sooner? Why do you not jump curves from one to the other one sooner? What are the transition points beyond the hockey stick? And, and, and you know what's really interesting because I've, I've written about this extensively and I have tons of you know CEOs and CIO clients that we talk to and they're always talking about KPIs. But you ask them, okay, well, here's your KPI and it's, I don't know, call, call time response or something meaningless like that, or, but they think it's important. And then you say to them, well, how much has that number changed in the last week, month, quarter, year? Correct. And if the number hasn't changed, why bother measuring it, right? Because because all you're doing, you're measuring your ability to do nothing or to remain the same as opposed to your ability to, to cause a change, to cause some improvement. And so what, you know, one, of the, one of the rules of thumb I've used with clients is um, if your KPIs are stagnating, you need a new KPI, right? You need to be looking for measuring and encouraging change. And so to your point, you know, if you're measuring is the KPI moving or not, that's an indication that that change is occurring in the organization. You're not stagnating. It's a really interesting way of thinking of it, actually. Well, you, you have to think total quality management. You know, the Ishikawa diagrams, the fish yeah, diagrams, yeah. Yeah. where your KPI is the head of the fish. And you need to figure out how do I decompose that fish? And in each of the branches in the spine, in the spinal cord of that fish and in all the little things, you're having partial derivatives that you can fine tune. So you, ha you can calculate which are the levers and the, the things that you can take leverage on to change your main KPI that your board of directors decided that, that they want to improve net customer satisfaction. Well, it doesn't matter you know, that you measure that every day if you don't do anything on the things that change that perception and that get people not to give you a 7 or 8, but to give you a 9 or a 10. 
Okay, because if you, everybody gives you a seven or an eight, your net, net satisfaction is crap. So the, the point I'm making is we, we use a technology called graph analysis, which is yep. based on graph databases. Uh, we use Neo4j, which is one of the most popular. And basically what you build is you build a graph. You, you build the Ishikawa thing as a graph and say, what is the components? And it's basically building a spreadsheet. You take a spreadsheet and say, how do you calculate that? And you build that into a graph database. And then you begin to in, automate the collection of that information in such a way that you can figure out what is trending. What is trending is not what is growing, it's what changed the speed of the growth. And yeah. a change in the speed of the growth, the first change is acceleration, the second is, is, uh, is jolt or jerk. And, and that's where you say, okay, something happened here. And then you go and figure out what happened that, okay? And you treat a positive change in the same way that you say TQM for a failure. You have to figure out what happened that is so good that this change propagated in the fish from this thing to the head of the fish so that your KPI changed. Otherwise, you just enjoy success and you don't know why. You yeah. have to understand not just the failure, but you have to understand the successes. That's a good way of thinking that. Uh, you, and, and, I mean, you're, you're practically giving the audience uh, an MBA in 25 minutes. The, the other, <laughs> is like, yeah. what do you say, graph analysis? Um, the, the other thing too, and, and this impacts greatly data and analytics and just like data warehousing, which to me is the dumbest thing you can ever do. But the other thing that's true is that if I'm collecting all this signal that I'm going to analyze, like 99.99999% of that data is utterly useless, yep. right? Because because it's saying things, you know, nothing really happened. If you think, I, I use the example, um, you have like the Nest temperature controller in your house, right? And mm -hmm. so you use it to remotely control the, the temperature in your house. And I'll, and I'll use Fahrenheit because I'm in America, but like if you, you set the house to 70 degrees and every five seconds, Nest says 70 degrees, 70 degrees, 70 degrees. It just keeps saying 70 degrees. It's utterly worthless information. But but it, and at one point, it's going to start saying, okay, well, 70 degrees, 80 degrees, 100 degrees, 150 degrees, your house is on fire. Yep. In that moment, now I have some interesting data to do something with, but I better see it immediately and I better act on it just as fast. So what's interesting is we, we aggregate all this massive amounts of data and the vast majority of it is utterly useless. Well, it's an interesting thing because the more you get to vast amount of data that doesn't change a lot, the more you should be processed that in the periphery. Yes. The reason for that is the same reason that if you hit your knee, it, you move the leg, and it's called reflex system. Okay. Yep. People who are doing IoT at large scale for cities are saying, if I detect an alarm, I need to process that as locally as possible. Yes. One, for faster speed. And we learn from nature. The, the speed to the signal is the speed of light, but it's faster if it doesn't re require your prefrontal cortex to require to move your hand when you're going to burn because you touch, you touch a hot stove. Okay? You, you move your hand first and then you feel the pain. That's and, literally and then you feel the pain. Yes. That's how the reflex system works. Okay, yep. It's decentralized processing. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated with working cross domains of knowledge. So if you want to explain somebody doing IoT how to work that, you get a biologist to explain why the frog does this or why your knee moves that and so on. And we were talking the other day in, in a pre-conversation that we have about the signals that the brain gives and how you can do metaphors comparing the signal that the brain gives or takes from the body with the way people manage employees. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we're talking about stress and cortisol and adrenaline and all that stuff. And if, you, if your style of management creates a dysfunctional culture, the situation is not to change your senses, but to change the signals that you're giving. And some of the signals are not electrical. Some of the signals are hormonal. You know, if you, if you create a company where the mood is good, you're going to create uh, uh, hormones that are good, that feel good. OK, as opposed to and, and that things have beneficial effects, even in a in a body that if you if you use metaphorically, you can say my organization is a living body, has some homeostasis and some self form of some controls. And my employees or the members of the organization are more able to tolerate moments of stress and will react better during a pandemic, for example, will change faster and accelerate the digital transformation and do things 
if they are used to an environment that is rewarding initiative, that is, is, is tolerating risk-taking, it's a safe environment. There's a study done in Google that says that the teams that work well are those where it's safe to speak your mind and fail. And so Google is a very successful company amongst 25 other reasons for that too. So, so George, I would recommend we write a paper on corporate hor hormones and corporate environments, but we'd probably get shadow banned or something. So I don't know that we could do that. <laughs> uh, well, <laughs> <coughs> but, you, you but you're absolutely right. Um, and, and when we were talking about that the other day, which kind of led to, to doing the call today, um, so I, you know, I wrapped up my operations model uh, research just a couple of weeks ago. And now, as I mentioned to you, I'm, we're, we're looking to do this research on the cybernetic organization. What does a company look like around 2030 um, after we go through this sort of singularity over the next few years of combining humans and automation in this new form of organization? And, and, and what we're envisioning is it's a very organic model. It's like a body. Just And so why what you were just saying is so apropos, where instead of having this big hierarchical structure and linear thinking and linear decision making, and it's all very controlling, it's going to be much more fluid and it's going to be much more organic in how it operates. Um, and so, you know, so many of the things that you're touching upon feed into that. And it's interesting, the more, the better our mathematics, the more we're going to enable ourselves to be more organic, which might almost seem counterintuitive, but I'd love your thoughts on that too. Well, if you look at DNA, DNA is the ultimate matrix. Yeah. If you, if you, if if you think of the TensorFlow and the TPUs and everything that Google is doing or, or all the process, you know, we are going back to copy nature. And if you want to understand how things have evolved, evolution is a very good thing. The, the, the evolution of species and whatever, organizations, you know, do not fight wars. They fight for survival. Mm. They do fight competitors. They do fight other things. But you're, you're looking in a, in a context in which how well you cooperate with other organizations and with the ecosystem and how much you control the ecosystem the ecosystem controls you has much more impact in your ability to be effective and survival than whatever you can do within your organization. So we, we go from an inbound looking at an organization to how do I fit in the big picture? Because to the consumer, to the world, the world is made of consumers, so the world of made is individual. It's not made of just an organization with deal with each other. So ultimately, your success depends on how well you're accepted by the people. Yeah. yeah. Money right. is a proxy for people at the end and, of the yeah. day. Well, and, and then we talk about the attention economy. I, I, I talk about that in Jerk, too, where you know likes become a currency, and lo and behold, yeah. it's happening, right? Um, it was for, for many years, it was annoying that I felt jerk was right. And now it's sort of gratifying that it's all proving to be right. But, but literally, I mean, you know, how do, how do the, how are the Kardashians so popular and wealthy? It's because they're popular. Right. Um, and, and so some, so many of those concepts are now coming really to the fore. And that's, that's what, again, gratifying getting jerks together. And that's the point of re, of launching the channel is, um, no kidding. I, this stuff is really happening now. And if you want to understand this world that we're moving into, you better get on board with this stuff. So, so again, going back to just the, the notion of jerk and derivative thinking and so forth. Um, if, if you're going to share with, you know, the people that are following this stuff, kind of how do you, cause you use a lot of big technical words and I'm happy to say that I followed that stuff, but if someone is expressing interest in how do you do this? How do you, how do you like engage in this sort of um, thought processes to apply new thinking to their business? G give us like your top two or three suggestions. Top suggestion is to understand the basics. You have to have a direction in which you're moving and everybody knows what direction they're moving or what direction they want to move at least. People who are smart know how fast they're going. People who are smarter know how much they're putting the pedal on, you know, how much to the metal they're going. And people who are really those that disrupt things begin to say, okay, uh, do I put a turbo in the car? Do I put a bottle of nitro in the car? Am I doing drug races or what? How I leave my competitors behind? How, how I get my company to have a leading edge on something? Those people in, a, in any gambling situation, you will call them cheaters. In business, you call smart people that are jerks, yeah. disrupt the business of everybody else who's doing the same that you were doing the day before. 
So the ability to control the acceleration of a company, not just to put the metal to the floor, but to change the structure of the engine that is driving your own company, that is what allow you to control the speed and the acceleration that you're moving forward. Of course, if you're going in the wrong direction, you're going to hit the wall regardless, even faster, okay? But assuming that you have a good idea, <laughs> assuming that you're going to manage it properly, then we give you the instruments to say, okay, it may be you start with a workshop, you say, what are the things that we're measuring? Why are we measuring this? Has it changed? How much has it changed? What are the components you build the Chicago design when you do the fish and say, what are the components that measure this? And what are the levers that you have to modify each of those components? God, and, it, well, and if I can, if I can interrupt, that is such a key thing. Like, if you don't have a lever to to, to manage that variable, why bother? Point exactly. Yeah. Leave it alone. It, Go it, away. My, <laughs> my, my point is, if you don't have a thermostat in your house and the aircon or the heater, there's no point knowing exactly what temperature it is at one particular point because you cannot do anything about it. So I say I say this with my kids, like everyone always worries about what they're doing. So I'm like, worrying is not a parenting skill, right? You, you, there's no benefit from worrying. You know, we use that energy to actually teach them something or whatever. But it, it's the same sort of thing. If you don't have a lever to deal with that particular variable, let it go. Well, the, the thing is, it's consuming your neurons, yeah. managing something, managing between quotes, managing something where you actually cannot do anything about it. Okay, so when people say, okay, global warming or particles in the ozone and whatever, and you say, what are, what, are we, what are we going to do about it other than measure that? Because if you don't manage the speed at which you reduce carbon in atmosphere, we're going to burn like in hell. So measuring it alone is the first level of awareness, okay? And there may be 12 steps depending on what program you're in, but there are many steps to go, okay? Yeah. And, and the steps that you have to do is, one, to be aware of where you are. The second way to be aware of what speed you're going and, and how are you changing that. And what, what I find interesting is that most people focus on worrying and generating adrenaline and stress and cortisol and all the things that you build in your head that says, I'm accumulating stress. And it's like, well, hold on. If you have adrenaline, that could be good because it prepares you for action. But if you don't do anything about it, it becomes toxic. Oh, jeez. So George, I love, do, it. I love it. Well, <laughs> I love it. Well, I do some executive coaching, okay? And part of the executive coaching, I coach individuals that are way more intelligent than me, okay? I'm borderline Mensa. They allowed me in just because I almost hit, the, like, the tennis ball. It passed. I'm borderline Mensa. I coach people who have IQ of 160. And I coach them on social skills and coaching on other things, Okay. And when you have an individual that is very intelligent, you have to say, you have to use your intelligence to change things. You cannot use your intelligence to understand and worry about things. And what happens is that most executives use information technology to worry about more things than they are actually managing. And by my definition of managing is effective change. Yes. Uh, I took a class many, many years ago with a professor called Eddie Obeng wrote a book called All Change. And he said that strategic is not what you do that affects the future. Strategic is what you do every day that makes more probable of all the possible future scenarios the one that you want. Mm. So you're in the business of altering the probabilities of doing something so that the biasing that you do that the scenario that you want to do is more probable. So think of bias test and you say, what can I do to make more probable what I want? And it's not, it's not saying, am I going right predicting what is going to happen in 2030? My strategy would be, what can I do today to make more probable that 2030 looks the way I would like to, to look? Exactly. And the, the way I paraphrase it, sort of American sort of phrase, is, is you, you fight, flight, or freeze, right? Your response. Correct. To, and, and the worst of those three options is the freeze, because as you said, the adrenaline that's going to drive activity, if you don't in, do anything, it's toxic. And you're exactly <laughs> right. If I look at business intelligence and I look at data analytics and metrics, so many executives use all of this, all this input and analysis to freeze, Right. And, we, and we, we have to analyze some more and we have to think some more. And so, no, you got to do something. Otherwise, it becomes toxic. It's such a great point. 
if I can recommend the book of a friend, there's a researcher that wrote a book called Literally, Why the Fuck Can I Not Change? <laughs> <laughs> I said, you know, I'll do that. Sounds like my and kind I, of jerk. Yeah, well, and, and basically what, what, what the researcher is saying is that uh, I, I met with her once and I say, I, I devised this technique for mentoring people and coaching people to speak in public. I know it works, but I don't know why it works. So she explained me why my technique, which was completely empirical and developed over 10 years, worked because I, I knew that it worked, but I didn't know why. And basically what happened is when you engage your prefrontal cortex, there's a flow of brain, of blood in your brain that takes blood from the amygdala and from the primate brain. So the reaction to fight, flight, or freeze is do neither of these three is start to think. Because mm. the moment you start to think and you engage your prefrontal cortex, you take blood literally from, <clears throat> and you take attention from the part of your brain that is creating that reaction of fight, flight, or freeze. And the modern human is prepared by nature to fight. And our way of fighting in this millennium is not to fight with our hands, but to fight with the prefrontal cortex. Mm. And we need to learn to react to things that are traditional fight, flight, or freeze with saying, what is the modern equivalent of picking the ax or picking the stick and beating somebody with their thing? Uh, we need to react in a different way. So there are metaphors that you say, how do I convert this energy and this adrenaline that I have in my bloodstream? Because I'm, uh, you know, I measure this and it's wrong. And what do I do about it? To active burning cellulose and burning sugar in your brain. And instead of doing physical activity, to do the mental activity that gets you out of that situation. And if you put people in, in a brain scanner, you will think, you will see that people who start to do uh, brainy things reduce the level of anxiety while solving the problem, as opposed to being worried by the problem and being frozen because they cannot do it. There's a very simple thing that I, this is a tip for those who speak in public. If you're counting how many people you're talking to, you're not going to have fear. Why? Mm. Because your brain is engaging count. You say, okay, one, two, three, and you're, you're delivering your chat in background, okay? But you're looking at how many people more or less are in the room. You, you keep, keep your brain doing anything to do and that reduces your level of anxiety. In the case of the executives, what you want is them to react using the prefrontal cortex as opposed to react using the amygdala and the reptilian brain that says, oh, we are in crisis. We know you're in crisis. Your job is to fix it, not to be worried about the crisis. Ah, geez. So, so <laughs> I, George, we could go on for ages. And, yeah, and I sorry. intend to because, <laughs> no, 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 I intend to because I'm going to have you come back because this is just gold. Um, I did, a lot of that stuff is what's came, come up in the ops model research that I did. It's a recurring theme, the, the, the need to act and so forth. But I love how you put that context in that, that it's, it's not just doing stuff. It's thinking as you do it. That's awesome. Um, my gosh, the time flies. I can't wait to have you back again. And thanks so much for the conversation. <laughs>